Let's podcast alongside Joe Gilio. I'm Joe Ovius inside Eford Studios in downtown Raleigh. Thanks to Empire Properties and thanks to Copiers Plus. Check them out online at copiers-plus.com. Did you know you can swap out all sorts of papers with your Kyocera printer, Joe? I'm currently in a state of panic over our friends from Copiers Plus because Drew is not going to be able to play in the OG Golf Classic this oh, year. Oh, no. However, okay. Drew being the corporate champion that he is, mm -hmm. would like for us to have a team, a Copiers Plus team okay. that we give away. So if you're interested in playing in the OG Golf Classic, thanks to our friends at Copiers Plus, send me an email. Julio.cho at gmail.com. We can do that. Yeah. Even better though, if your company has data management needs, mm -hmm. please go to copiers-plus.com. Or if you happen to be a hockey team manager and you need to print out a bunch of stickers on a template, Ooh. you can do that. Got sticker helmets? Hel hel helmet Roster stickers? Roster stickers, apparently. I'm learning all sorts of ins and outs about this travel hockey life, man. I am... Uh, it's it's way too organized of a Whoa. thing for me to be doing. Let's just put it that yeah, way. I could see that. Yeah, it's a little too organized. Still waiting for, for you to wear the jacket. I haven't gotten my, episode. I have not gotten my official team jacket yet. I have my normal one that I bought a couple no, years ago. No, no, no. I want that. I know you want the actual team manager yeah. jacket. When that thing arrives, I will make sure that I wear. It. I mean, per today's a perfect day for it. I mean, I saw a couple we got when I walked in today. I know. I saw a couple when I walked in. They were wearing full on pants. And members only jackets, and no, I'm no, going. No, no. Whoa, no, what is happening? No, 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 no. Today is a classic North Carolina hoodies and shorts kind of a day. Speaking of things I'd like to reclaim, I feel like we have to hit up Ethan to see if we can do a hoodies and shorts video on Fayetteville Street with some of our gear from Breaking Tea. Okay, that Perfect. would be that Perfect. would be. Great. I got my Breaking Tea on today, so you got your rowback on today. Um, that's what you have. Rowback. Get, yeah, get, you get get the corporate <laughs> champions right. Don't confuse my champions. We have so many hoodie <laughs> corporate champions. Rowback, home field, I'm, breaking tea. There's so many to choose I'm from. That's why we have to do a video. I'm just excited that my Rowback people have the triple D now. <laughs> they released it. I don't know if you saw the, the, the selected colleges it. that have deals with them. Yeah. Uh, among them is SMU. And I was like, Oh boy, my here smooth. we go. Here That's my we smooth. go. Now, I haven't had a chance to see that because I was too busy catching up on the Scott Fowler, Charlotte Observer, Sports Legends of North Carolina feature on Mac Brown. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's 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 a really nice feature. You know, Scott has a good back and forth with a lot of these guys that he's been able to talk to for this feature that's now, I think, a couple years running, right? And the part that got my attention was Scott Fowler asking Mac Brown about retirement. You remember, you go back to ACC kickoff. Mac Brown was very defiant about the retirement talk, talking about, oh, everybody wants me retired. And eight of these guys, I'm paraphrasing here, like eight of these guys who were telling people that I was going to retire have been fired. One of them's on his staff right now, apparently, if you believe that. And apparently he called Mike Elko, too. Uh, he's like, oh, you know. I'm here longer than you, Mike. You, you left for Texas A&M. The way Mac phrased it to Scott, I couldn't help but chuckle. And then I also had a, a question for North Carolina fans and how they process what Mac tells Scott Fowler. What do you tell people? I'm sure you're asked all the time, but what do you tell people, recruits, et cetera, when they ask you the retirement question now? Uh, it gets asked before they say hello now. And I, <laughs> I bet. Right. And, I, and I do think, as you said, uh, Roy retires at 72. Coach Saban retires at 72. Villanova's coach Jay Wright retires. So uh, a lot of people are saying, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm just not going to do it anymore. And, right. and to me, it's been more of a, I'm needed more right now than ever before. The game needs older people with experience that, that can help make some sense out of this stuff. The kids need uh, a balance and, and uh, they need a, a, a soothing, confident influence. And uh, I'm a better coach now than I've ever been because I've still got my energy, but I've got more experience and more confidence than I've ever had. Uh, and, and that's where all this stuff comes together. Uh, so what I tell them is that Texas, I got tired 30 straight years. And I started talking about retirement. I started talking about what I'm going to do next. I started talking about who's going to take the, the job over and what do we do for the assistant coaches to help them. And when you do that, you're getting ready to be through. So we didn't do as well at the end. 
So when Sally and I got back in, we said, we're not going to think about it. We're not going to talk about it. We're just going to work our tail off. And then one day when it's best for the university and best for the kids, we'll know it and we'll just stop. But we're not going to prepare to stop. And and I think that's a, a huge difference in in where we are now and where we were then. Uh, we're offering 27 quarterbacks and running backs from the class of 27. Why would I be doing that if I'm thinking about quitting? <laughs> or why would I be up here working so hard? So, so when people come in, I, I tell the families, I know you're going to ask me if I'm going to quit because every coach has told you I'm going to quit. And I said, what a great compliment to me that they want me to quit. Before, I would just say, um, I can't believe they said that. Yeah. Really and truly, it's a great compliment. Yeah. They want me to quit. They want you out. So that's a good thing. <laughs> when you do decide that it'll be sort of sudden at the end of a season like Roy did, or do you do you anticipate that you would say a year in advance as Coach K did and then have a year of – people honoring Mac Brown at every, um, you know, road stop. No, I'm not an honor guy. Coaches have egos and I'm, I'm, I've got one, I've got all that, but I'm, I'm not a guy that likes a lot of attention. I'd rather walk in the room and be quiet and be in the back and people ask me questions and I can answer them. Uh, but I, I, I do think since I'm not going to think about it at all, there'll be a day that I'll get up and just say, uh, I think it's best right now for North Carolina to transition to this, and then I'll do it. Mm. But I, I sure I, I'll be in the mountains of North Carolina playing golf or, or fishing for <laughs> trout or on the beach, uh, yeah. and I'll be out of the way. So that's Mac Brown with Scott Fowler. It's about a 40-minute conversation. That's the part of the conversation I thought, I thought was more interesting because, Joe, heck, I got this question. I did a, a, a hit with College Sports Now with Stephen Hartzell and, and Roddy Jones. And they asked about Mac Brown and, and retirement and things like that. I was actually talking to our friend Jordan Kramer uh, w, uh, with uh, CNC, uh, Channel 17. And she was asking about Mac Brown. Like, everybody's curious about Mac Brown and retirement, so it's going to be a conversation. But I was, I was surprised at how he framed it, and I guess it gives you insight into how Mac Brown is thinking. And it ties back to the conversation we had with him back at ACC kickoff, where he's like, I like to fix things. North Carolina still needs to be fixed. He truly believes he's the only one who can really do it. There's a There was an extra piece later on in the, in the conversation with Scott Fowler where it made me think of you, because he gave a story about Bobby Bowden and how they were on some sort of Nike trip with Bobby Bowden. And they were talking about you know retirement and what are you going to do next and, and everything else. And Bowden, essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, but Bowden essentially said, yeah, man, if I retire, I'm worried about being bored. I'm worried about death, essentially. And Max, like, I'm not that far, but I do agree that without coaching, I don't know what my purpose is going to be. And that's kind of the interesting spot where North Carolina is right now with Mac Brown when there's a lot going into this season about where the direction of the program is headed with Mac Brown 2.0 coming off of Sam Howell and Drake May. Yeah, let's start where where he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And that is when you start thinking about the end, it is over. Totally agree. So I, I, he's absolutely 100% correct about that. Uh, and I, he's interesting in the sense that when he says, yeah, it's a compliment now that when people are like, I'm going to retire, it's going to be over, it's going to be this. I, I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. When, when he first came back and he took the program from where it was, in the final two or three years under Larry Fedora and made them instantaneously respectable mm -hmm. was guns blazing. Absolutely. You know, getting everyone he wanted in, in Charlotte and in Sam Howell and Drake may and flipping Drake may from Alabama and Josh downs and, and all of the players that they were getting. Uh, sorry, the poor kid who transferred the five-star kid who they were all excited about who, I, who they hate me over. Oh, what uh, uh, Grimes. Yeah. You know, I mean, they were really, Take, kick an ass and taking an names on the mm -hmm. recruiting trail. He put himself in a situation where he could have the conversation about this is my legacy. This is, I call the shots. I'm the one who's going to say when it's over. The way that the team has performed in the final, the la in the final five, six games of the last two years mm -hmm. and, and the way that they've underperformed as a favorite is, is a direct correlation to his coaching. Now, at 72 years old, I don't think Mac is is locked in on the headsets and calling plays and doing all these other things. I think he has turned that over to his lieutenants. Mm -hmm. Okay. But 
I don't think he's in the same situation he was in 19 and 20 where he can call the shots realistically. Yeah. I think that's his point of view. I think North Carolina and Bubba Cunningham and their leadership should have a different point of view about who gets to decide when it's over Mm -hmm. for Mac Brown, because the way that the team has performed after the way that they started in in the two Drake may years. And then the, you know, the, obviously the fumble that they had in, in 21, the final year, Sam, they went six and seven with Sam Howell that final year when they were preseason top 10 team. Yeah. The next year they lost the final four games of 22 last year. They lost four of their last six games with an NFL top five draft pick. Like this is not a, this would be the akin to Chuck Amato sitting here telling you in year seven. Oh yeah, I'll be the one who tells you what happens. And, and there's a little bit of a disconnect. And money, 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 money. Yes, the money people like Mac. I guess that that's why he's still the football coach of North Carolina. But the truth of the matter is that was his last mulligan last year. This isn't he. He's not in the situation where he's going to dictate the terms. I know he wants to be in Bobby Bowden's class. I know he wants to be in Bear Bryant's class. I know he wants to, you know, take out the scandal of the Joe Paterno class, Mm -hmm. but he's not in that class of you did leave. (laughs) Sometimes he acts like he was at North Carolina this whole time. The whole time. Yeah. It's like, but it was understandable why he left. Nobody blames you for going to Texas. Nobody begrudges you the success you had at at, at Texas or the things that you learned at Texas. But you're right there on you're right there on the doorstep as to why Mac Brown thinks of himself differently at North Carolina. You're right on the doorstep. I mean he's never won the ACC title. He came <laughs> back though. He came back. The donors love him. Yeah. And that's where the friction is. The donors view Mac Brown like the ones who matter. The one that Mac Brown says, "Yeah, I talked to the these seven or six eight. guys <laughs> yeah, yeah. and ask them questions and get their input because Mac's really good at keeping those people happy." Yeah, you'll by charm the, your pants off. By the way, Mac, come on, man, you're not the guy who comes in and sits in the back of the room. You're the guy who entertains the room. Come on, exactly, come exactly. On, like, I mean, look, there's there's <laughs> what he there's what he sells and what it actually <laughs> is, and every coach does this. Every coach has this has this sell. But you're right on the doorstep of the friction that's about to take place at North Carolina, depending on how the season goes. You have the way the donors view Mac Brown and the history of North Carolina football. You're right; they haven't won the the they haven't won they haven't won the championship. They haven't won a title since he's been here. Their seasons ultimately end up being empty calorie seasons, despite the fact that they represented the Coastal Division. Right? I get all that stuff, but in Mac's mind, he does view himself as the Roy Williams or Dean Smith of football. Yeah, he views himself as the Anson Dorrance of football. It's all relative. So in his mind, yeah, for us, it makes sense. Dean Smith's going to call the shot when he calls the shot because he's won two national championships. He is the cornerstone of UNC basketball. Roy, being the Dean disciple who wins three national championships, has the right to basically call the shot when he wants to call the shot. We just talked about Anson Dorrance and what the hell he did at UNC with soccer. And yeah, man, he's going to call the shot when he wants to call the shot. Mac, relative to football success, views himself in the same boat. If you think I'm full of shit when I say that, go back and listen to Mac Brown and how he talks about what they've done at North Carolina the first go-round and the second go-round. When he was defending himself and defending the program last year, he was very quick to tell you the stats about how many times they've won and how often it happens in North Carolina, and you should be appreciative of the fact that when he came back, he was able to get back to these amount of wins, even if they end up being somewhat empty calories. So Mac a national champion who comes back to North Carolina to bring, to your point, bring North Carolina back to respectability, bring North Carolina back to having that well, buzz. Interest. An interest in, in football. He views himself in that boat. So it makes sense that he thinks that he's just going to wake up one day and say, I'm out of here. But this is where we get to the friction. While the boosters might like that, while he believes that, the wild card in all of this is Bubba Cunningham. He's the wild card in all of this. At some point, depending on how this year goes, I'd be really curious to see how Bubba Cunningham handles this. Mac's not going to go away all nice and quiet, clearly, based on how he kind of views himself and how he's talking about it with Scott Fowler. That's fine. That's how he views it. But Bubba's got a different job. And I'm just curious if Bubba's the kind of guy that's willing to tell. He hasn't had to do this yet. You know? He, He has not had to have a rough conversation with a legendary coach about, hey, man, it's time for you to go. 
He didn't have to do it with Roy. He didn't have to do it with Anson. He might have to do it with Mac. I'd be really curious to see how that plays out and what gets leaked out. Because sometimes it ends up being pretty bad. Like David Cutcliffe's still mad at Duke yep. for the way things ended there. Yep. Because he felt, hey, man, I brought you guys back to respectability. I showed up in an ACC championship game. I won a division. I should be able to go out the way I wanted to. Didn't work out that way because Nita King had other plans, other ideas. What's Bubba's? And that's the next question going forward. I don't, I'm not... I am not going to play. I'm saying it right up the right off the bat since you know we're having this conversation now. If we don't talk about Mac Brown's retirement possibilities the rest of the year, that's fine. Let's just let this season play sure. out the way that it play at plays out. My question is, what kind of direction would Bubba Cunningham want to go in? Because the succession plan, whatever might have been, that's out the window. There's really nobody on staff that you're going to point to and go, "Okay, cool, that's the guy I want to be the next head coach." The, the bloom off Scott Fat Scott Satterfield is, is gone, right? Like, remember he was the hot thing yeah. for for a bit there. He's he's bounced around a little bit. Maybe there was a time back when Matt got hired the the second go round at North Carolina. You could have made the uh, the argument for Satterfield, but where, what direction does North Carolina go in when Mac decides to retire? And I don't know. Do you go young up and coming guy? Do you bring in another respected coach? Do you have the money to bring a guy from another program? I just don't know. I really don't know. And I'd love to pick Bubba's brain on that kind of thing when the time comes. It, it, this is going to be an interesting season because I, I I don't think the bottom is going to fall out on Carolina. No. I know some people are, no, are no, thinking, no, no. well, they don't have you know Drake May anymore and this thing could turn on them. Listen, they still have a lot of talent on that team. It's never and, been the and, problem. And their schedule is very, very manageable. Yeah, man. Um, so I again, I could see them winning seven or eight games this year, which would be a par for what Mac has done mm-hmm. for sure. But I, it's interesting, you know, the mindset of someone like Mac, you know, you have to convince yourself again. I, I say this to people all the time for, if you want to be great, you have to want to be great. And, and Mac is great. He wants to be great. Mm-hmm. He has convinced himself that he's great. Well, he, he can't knock him out of that mindset. No. And that's important that he, he sticks to that, but uh, there is a disconnect though. And you say boosters, yeah, there's some of them. But I, I think we're getting to a point with the Carolina fan base, portions and pockets of that fan base, who look at what he's done and say, okay, that was good. I'm glad we're not in the situation that we were in under at the end of Larry. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad that you came back. I'm glad we had these warm and fuzzies. But the truth of the matter is now, Carolina's not looking at this saying, well, what can we do in the ACC? Carolina's next step is, how do we now position ourselves for either the big 10 or the sec and keep in mind now when you're sitting at the poker table and you can't find the the, the lamb you can't find the person who's the patsy yeah. you're it you're the mark yeah and you, you think the reason the big 10 wants you is because jim delaney's kid is going to give you private equity no mm. <laughs> they want you because you're going to be the fucking mark in the big 10 football that's why they want you they want okay the, they want the brand yeah, there's nothing wrong with the brand. You want the brand, but you're eager to bring in teams that you're like, oh yeah, come on in. Oh, okay, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, as yeah. as we circle back, like Maryland, I would love to go talk to my recruits in the state of North Carolina and mm-hmm. tell, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna play in front of Bob every yeah. year, hey, and you are absolutely no threat to beat us. So right. you know that's where that's where North Carolina yeah. needs to have their head. I have all, I have full faith in Bubba Cunningham that he can make this thing work. I. I lament that Dre Bly wasn't the answer. And I no, think that's no, probably no. what it was in the back of their heads. I think that was probably a good plan to have in place. And, uh, you know, you saw the recruiting success that they had under Dre. And, you know, I think it's changed a little bit. So we'll see what they do. One thing I'll disagree with you, though, uh, in terms of those boosters and whatnot, I think the ones that actually have the money, the ones who have the most amount of inf- influence are still behind yeah. background. The person you're describing, I think, is the person who's sitting in the upper deck of Keenan. They're mm-hmm. the, I no. think, I, think the I mean, part- I don't think Ken's in the upper deck, but I mean, he's also not in the, in the, in the, uh, no disrespect to Ken. Yeah. Ken's not in the circle of trust in the Mac Brown sure. thing. I'm no, not, I'm, no I'm Mac not say- called his shot. He said five or six people, whatever he said, those guys, those are the money guys. Right. But what I'm saying is at some point you have to look at this and say, again, mm-hmm. the warm and fuzzies are awesome, but what is our path forward? And I think Bubba Cunningham is now, now this is also going to be where is, where does Bubba? What's his kind of pull? What's his rank? Because I don't know. Honestly, if we put Bubba in this chair right now and we said to him, would you have made a change after the end of last season? I think he would say yes. Yes. I mean, 
you can't go to that game at Carter Finley Stadium and have that team not show up for that football game and sit here and go, wow, that was awesome. Like, and I get it. The, the, the totality of their programs are more than just how they perform on one Saturday each or Friday each year. But the truth of the matter is, I, I've been going to those games for 30 years now. That's the first time. And understand what I'm saying here clearly. I've seen Carolina kick NC State's ass plenty of times. Yeah, I've seen State beat Carolina and kick their ass plenty of times. I have never seen a team simply not show up for the football game. Mm-hmm. And not only not show up, but with Drake May. Mm-hmm. So I can count on no hands the number of times I ever saw Phillip Rivers not show up for a football game. Yeah, No hands. Yeah. Okay. So that's the situation that they're in now. And you're also lamenting what you missed. Okay. This was a team that could have been in the college football playoff. Legitimately, Mm -hmm. legitimately Pittsburgh and freaking Wake Forest played in the ACC championship game while you sat there and were like, Hey, uh, cool, cool. You went six and seven preseason top 10. Mm -hmm. So again, this is the reality. He is a champion. He has his mindset. I get that. But there's also a reality portion to this. And I think that's where this season kind of comes to a head. If there was an HBO behind the scenes, hard knocks, this would be the perfect team of combustible elements to follow this year. There is a reality distortion field at every college campus for every program. The one around Mac Brown is fascinating to me. So we'll see how the season plays out. Housekeeping. Thanks to Enovana for sponsoring housekeeping. You can check them out online. Enovana.com green cleaning solutions. If you have mess inside your mansion or trash in your cabana, give it green clean with Enovana. Podcast Festival is on Saturday. We're going to take the stage at six o'clock. We've got Hand of the Dirt following that. And of course, shut down full cast in the house. To close things out, we'll have opportunities to have access to more hats. I got to go pick those up. Uh, Homefield's going to be in the house uh, as they've got an exclusive Sports Podcast Festival hoodie. You can get that at the Sports Podcast Festival only. And if you want to get yourself a new football hoodie, I mean, the weather's perfect for it, as we mentioned earlier, you can head to homefieldapparel.com and use that promo code OG24 to save 15% off your order. If you're watching on YouTube, you are seeing a fantastic array of hoodies from the Wolfpack to the Tar Heels. That App State hoodie is on my list of things to purchase. As the weather gets better, and it's all at homefieldapparel.com. And we can't do the podcast festival without our friends at Breeze Through. Check them out, breezethrough.com. Download the app. You can save money on gas. And as we get into football mode, you know the Breeze Through has that spot right outside Carter Finley Stadium. There's one not too far from Chapel Hill. It's a great spot to pick up your tailgating needs, beer, whatever it is you need, snacks, ice. Ice is key. Drop on by the Breeze Through, breezethrough.com. I don't know. Maybe, uh, Maybe you want to bring ice cream too. You need the ice for the ice cream. Whoa, whoa. you know what would be good? Whoa, you go to Roosters. Who doesn't? Who doesn't love tailgating with ice cream? Whoa, especially in September because you know this is false fall. That would be next level. It's false fall. You know it's going to be blazing hot in September. The real question is how so get to is Roosters. Jared going to top the peanut butter cookie? How he always does it. every month. He does, but he how is he going to do it? Because September is going to be here before you know it. I would go. I am actually contemplating buying a freezer. Okay. In order to buy the the hundred dollar tub of the peanut butter cookie, it's that <laughs> good. Love that. Love that. And uh, well, we're gonna have an OG live tomorrow in the studio. OG live by Sleek Fleet next week will be at Longleaf Swine. Check out longleafswine.com. You can put in an order to I don't know cater a tailgate if you want to. You could do a home tailgating situation. Get your food from t- uh, Longleaf Swine. And I just posted this on Reddit because I lurk on Reddit. Best smash burger in town at Longleaf Swine. I've had a lot of people text me, our friends and confidants say, all right, man, what what time is the swine open? I got to go. <laughs> uh, or, and I even had a friend like, hey, I was looking at their menu online and I don't see the burger. Okay, listen, listen, this isn't like the secret pint club. No, no, no. It's dinner. It's just a dinner item. And That's weekend all. lunch. That's all. Weekend lunch and dinner. That's what it's all about. Wednesday through Sunday. Go check them out. Pretty please. Sugar on top. Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline is the head coach at ECU. He is Mike Houston. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you guys having me on. 
just in time to name a starting quarterback. No, uh, no games, no gimmicks, no, like, we're just going to like throw somebody out there for the first snap to throw everybody off. You're just calling it now and getting going. Well, we, I, I just felt like it was important to kind of get it out of the way. Uh, it's been a, it's been a very, very tight competition. Both, both quarterbacks have played very, very well in the preseason. I mean, at practice this morning, I thought both of them were extremely sharp. Um, and then, you know, but, but we felt like we needed to go ahead and name a starter, uh, you know, get that kind of behind us, uh, let him start really working with that first unit, uh, and gelling, uh, you know, cause you know, getting, getting that chemistry is going to be the biggest thing we need to do before the opener. I was curious about Jay Garcia, who you named as the starting quarterback going into the start of this year. And it, it almost seems like he's a good example of just kind of where college football is today. He's had a path. He's had a path yeah. to Greenville. And I do wonder after bouncing around a little bit, you know, I remember him from Miami. Obviously he's, he's at um, Missouri. He comes to you. If there's, um, if there's like a growth or a maturity that comes with the fact that you've had opportunities, they maybe not have gone the way you thought, but here's okay. another opportunity for you. Well, you know, I had that, I had that conversation with Kate and just told him, I said, listen, I said, you know, the one thing I said, Jake has been through so much. Um, I just think that experience has helped him a little bit. Um, you know, he's, he's just, he's very composed. Things don't get to him. He doesn't get rattled. Uh, you know, just has, has sort of a great kind of calming, you know, kind of way of going about things, you know, good play or bad play. He just, he doesn't really change. His demeanor doesn't change. And I think that's a, you know, certainly a good, uh, a good attribute to have. Coach, I remember last year watching the first couple of games and you'd see a transfer here, a transfer there from ECU. And I, I tried to tell people now, you, you, you had some guys, you lost some guys now. We saw one of them in the NFL too. You're running back with the Ravens. Uh, it feels like you guys did really well in the portal this time around the reloading. You mentioned yep. the two quarterbacks. You got two guys on defense, one from Louisville, one from Ohio State. So yep. how, how did that kind of, was it a mindset change for you or was it just the reality of where we are now in this NIL portal era? Um my alums uh, provided us with some NIL money. Yeah, <laughs> be honest. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, we tried to be aggressive in the transfer portal last year, and and we just we weren't very uh, very successful. Um, you know, obviously, you know, last year was not a, a season I ever want to go through again, and uh, so you know, I, I had my mind pretty determined, uh, you know, before the season was over, of what we needed to do and and what we needed. Um, so I was able to, uh, have an offense coordinator hired pretty quickly. Uh, and then, uh, with the support of our collective, we were able to go out and, uh, I think be very successful in the transfer portal with adding pieces to, uh, what we had already, uh, and retaining the top pieces that we had on the roster. Um, you know, but in today's, uh, college football landscape, if you don't have that kind of support, uh, it's really tough. So, uh, you know, we're very fortunate. I, I feel bad. We're we're catching you in football mode. You're 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 in super duper coach mode, and I, I certainly appreciate that. As as a my dad was a co high school coach when I was growing up, uh, but I, I'm curious of the mindset because you, you've been successful at every stop. You've been successful at ECU too. You you said it. You you never want to go through again the year that you had last year at ECU. But I, I'm looking at some of these pieces. I'm looking at your schedule, and I I just had said to Joe before we started. What is, I know it's crazy. You won two games last year. I get that. Well, what is standing in ECU's way and, and a spot in the college football playoff? Realistically. I mean, you're in a conference that you can win. Yep. You play two teams in App State and Liberty who are the favorites to win the other group of five conferences. So you have right. opportunity there. I know, exactly. I know there's some lamenting there in, in Greenville about not having a power five, power four conference opponent. But I look at App State and Liberty and I go, those are unbelievable chances for ECU. you uh, what you, you ask. You ask Mac Brown or Dave Doran, uh, you know, how, how excited they would ha they would be to have App State and Liberty both on their schedule. Uh, <laughs> well, we we got that answer from Mac last year. <laughs> when he said, I mean, but I mean, he, I mean he's, he's like, oh, we're not playing them again. That's Dave's yeah. problem now. So. Right. But you know, we have a challenging non-conference schedule. Uh, yeah. Certainly the. Uh, you know, the stretch there where you have App State, Liberty, and uh, UTSA back to back to back is going to be tough. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we have a chance to win every single game on our schedule. Um, I think we've got to really focus on 
uh, you know, what's right in front of us. I think we've got to, you know, no matter what happens, we got to kind of keep our, ourselves kind of even keeled uh, as a as a, a team, as a roster. Uh, and I think we've just got to we got to focus on going out and playing our best brand of ball. So really, we ask what what what's in our way, probably ourselves, uh, you know, because I think this team has a lot of potential. Now we got to go out and do it on game day. And certainly we, you know, starting with our road game at ODU, uh, you know, we've got we got to go and we got to show up every single every single game. I know it sounds crazy, but again, to go from two to, to where I think you could go, I'm not not trying to put any pressure on you there. You got your own pressure. I know that we, we've had the same discussions internally. Okay, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I stood up in front of our team and, and told them. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think we got a chance to have a special season. Now we got to we got to do it one game at a time. But uh, I think the potential is there. Is that the hard? Even though you have a lot of new parts, is that the hardest part? Is just convincing them. One thing I like to tell James: before you can be great, you have to want to be great. There's no doubt. Yeah. And is that the toughest part to get that into their mindset? Your mindset. You're a national right. champion. You've taken multiple schools to a playoff. You, you've been there. You know it. But is it harder to try to tell those kids, like, hey, no, 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 like, we 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 actually made fun of Dabble last year when he was like, no, no, no really, we're like six plays away from being undefeated, and he's it's like, not wrong though. You know, is is that kind of the the trick that you're trying here in August to convince these players, like, hey, guys, it's in front of us, man. Well, I, I think we need success early. Uh, I think that's going to be important. Um, you know, one thing about my teams at, at James Madison, uh, no matter who we played, they expected to win. And they expected to, you know, beat the snot out of them every single week. Uh, they had that swagger about them. Um, I think that we have the potential for that swagger, but I think we we all have to have it. You know, defensively, our bunch thinks they're pretty dang good. And I've got some guys on offense that uh, that believe in themselves. But uh, as a team, uh, I think we need some success early to really, you know, gain that confidence that you need, uh, you know, to, to do what we want to do. I am curious. I guess it's a it's a calculus in how you go about things or or how maybe the college football playoff might have reset what what we talk about and how we go about it. To, to, to go back to the start of the conversation and uh, what you want to change and and part of that change is going to your boosters and and asking for money. I mean it's 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 as, it's as simple as that. And I feel like now with the college football playoff, maybe those conversations with the boosters and understanding what it what it takes to change the direction of a football program can kind of come together because before with the college football playoff and only four teams, the realistic chances uh, for a group of five team were minuscule. I mean, you had to be right. perfect and you needed eight different things to happen in order for you to even right. get a chance at this. But now as Jillia pointed yeah. out, that schedule is tough. You can win your league. You could be the highest rated group of five. Does right. that conversation change with the boosters now with this open as it is? Well, I don't know how much they, that factors in. Um, certainly we use it in recruiting, uh, yeah. talk about it with, with all of our recruits. Uh, the, the thing is still, and it's not just, it's not, this is not East Carolina thing. This is, this is a, a lot of different schools are, are experiencing this mm -hmm. is our boosters still don't love name and image likeness. <laughs> you know, they don't, they, you know, for 30 years or whatever, you're told you can't do this. And now all of a sudden, well, you can do whatever you want to. And, and, you know, they, they just, it's getting them to embrace this and they're coming around. Uh, certainly like I'm, like I said before, they were much more supportive this year than the year before. Mm -hmm. uh, the collective, I have a group of, a group of businessmen that are working very, very hard uh, with our collective. We had a function yesterday, uh, had a lot of our, had 400 donors there, had our, our players there. Um, so, you know, it's come, they're coming around, but that's, that's the biggest obstacle we have is just getting them to understand that this is a big part of roster management. Now uh, it's a big part of retaining your top players. Uh, it's a big part of bringing in the, the transfers that you want. Uh, you know, it's, you, you wouldn't have the, the receivers, the quarterbacks, you know, those two defensive kids that you mentioned, you wouldn't have our top returning players if we weren't able to um, support them with name and image likeness. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing after, the year you have, you go back, you reevaluate everything. You you know you're trying to fix things, and obviously the, the fixes have to come on offense. What was it about John David Baker, and, and maybe maybe about his philosophy or personality that you looked at and said, "All right, this is the guy who can really help us." You know, and and for fans of ECU, remembering Lincoln Riley and remembering scoring some points and having a a really exciting offense. What what was it maybe about John David Baker that kind of caught your attention that you thought, okay, 
this is the answer for ECU. Well, I think, you know, I, I, I interviewed probably 20 to 25, uh, you know, different candidates, then narrowed it down uh, and brought three to campus. Um, and just in my conversations, and he and I did multiple Zooms, um, some phone calls, and then, you know, a couple of days, you know, with his, with his interview. Um, number one, talking to people in the industry and, you know, talking to Lane Kiffin, talking uh, to, 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 to the coaches at USC, uh, you know, the, the people he was with at North Texas. Um, you know, they all think he's a rising star. Uh, they certainly think he has uh, the mind and the kind of it, uh, you know, so you had good background check. But then when you when you when you started talking to him and you just I love his demeanor. He's kind of got uh, a, a quiet confidence uh, and he just he believes in what he's doing. And I just I, I, I love the scheme. I think it's it's different. It's a lot different for me. Uh, I mean, you know, ten years ago I was running the wishbone, so uh, I'm I'm at, I'm at the complete other end of the spectrum now. So, um, but I think the scheme I think the scheme fits East Carolina. Uh, our fans they do have great memories of of the offenses that uh, Lincoln had here, and uh, you know it 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 fits in that same genre. Uh, and I think it gives us a chance. I think we were able to get the pieces to run his offense. Um, but then after being with him for eight months, uh, the players believe in him. He has, he has a great command of uh, the room when he talks to our players. And he has a true identity, uh, and his identity fits us. Uh, so there's just there's so many things that give me confidence with him. Now, August 31st is going to be the first game he's called as a college football coach. So it'll be his first time being the guy calling the plays. He was the, mm-hmm. co-OC, he was the co-OC at Ole Miss. Um, you know, he called a ton of scrimmages. He was heavily involved in the game plan. He was heavily involved in, uh, in, 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 in doing everything except calling the plays. And so uh, he's still he, he still got to go do it. What is your game day? What, what, what is, where, where are you on game day? How, where, how active are you on those calls? Uh, do you have the binder with all of the, the scripted plays and everything else? Or are you more of like a Okay, that sounds good. Let's get the play in. Let's do it. Or what is your what is your game day vibe there? John Davis is going to call the offense. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, and it's you know certainly we'll have a lot of conversations throughout the week on. I want to know what uh, he's doing situationally. Uh, I am very involved in our you know four down territory. You know when we're you know hey we got four downs right here, and I try to get that information to him on second down so that he can think ahead. I'm very involved with that, um, but it's he's the offensive coordinator. Um, you know, I'm sure that there'll be times when he'll ask me my advice, uh, but I'm not uh, I'm not here to look over his shoulder or do anything else. Uh, you know, I hired him to run our offense. I feel like his problem wouldn't be you wondering what the game plan is. I feel like his problem might be your players who have been playing college football 25 since it dropped on their game systems this summer, and they go to you or they go to him, and they're saying, "Hey, look, coach, I'm just saying this play." Works every time for me. <laughs> Maybe we mix that in. I don't know. I'll tell you what. He he has no shortage of plays. Okay, All and right. he is and he, he is very. Though? Is there a wishbone package? He's he's very creative. You're going to see us. You're you, by the by the time we get to the end of the season, you're going to see a little bit of everything from us. Right. I want to see some wing tea thrown in for me, for for good measure and, on that. And now, coach, I I can't I can't promise you the stars here now, sir. Uh, I can promise you, if you need something from my man, Jordan Green, you hit him up. He's the best. You already know Thank that for Adidas. But every coach who gave us extra time last year had an unbelievable season. <laughs> All right. My guy. I'm, 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 glad you, I'm glad you had me on then. That's what I'm saying. You got to you tell Malcolm, you, you come talk to the OG because we had Paul Maurice, Florida Panthers, puts his name on the Stanley Cup. Mm-hmm. My man, Elliot Avent goes to the College World Series. Kevin Keats goes to the Final Four. NC State wins. ACC championship for the first time since 1987. So, Coach, I I'm, I ain't promise you a spot in the playoff, but I'm telling you, Pirates, you get you, no quarter this year, man. No quarter. We have a shot. I'm excited. Uh, I'm, I'm ready for August 31st. I can tell you that the kids are too. <laughs> yeah, I think I think everybody's in that boat uh, right now, Coach. We appreciate that time. Best of luck this season. Thanks a lot for having me on. You guys have a great afternoon.
We are so close to the start of the football season. Week zero is arriving, which means we're not too far away from the Matt Davis 12 game of the week. We will be highlighting this in the near future once the football season officially starts up. In the meantime, if you want to save money on your home and auto insurance, contact Matt Davis today, 919-779-8277. You can check him out online at suregarner.com, voginsurance.com, but I can't stress this enough, a real human, Joe, 919-779-8277. Save money. That's a good thing. Uh, I'm looking forward to TC TCU against SMU. Let's go. That'll be the first official <laughs> Matt Davis 12 game of the OG schedule. Now, as we mentioned, uh, don't get duped by false fall. It's going to get hot again. That means that means the mosquitoes are not done for the rest of the summer. Uh, and maybe you're going to be hanging out in your backyard watching football on your outdoor TV. You don't want the mosquitoes to ruin it for you. So you know what you do? You contact Mosquito Authority and Pest Authority. Check them out. Bugs bite. Dot com. Maybe you don't want to be stressed out while you watch football. You want a low-key, chill vibe while watching football. May I suggest you go to nature, naturesreliefhempstore.com, R-E-L-E-A-F, hempstore.com. Put the beer aside for a bit. Get yourself a hippie sip. Get yourself a gummy. Get yourself a five flowers and vibe out to the football. And don't get stressed if your team wins or loses might benefit you uh and i got great news i was out in holly ridge glenwood area yeah yesterday delivering a hat Ooh, yes by the way how access. many more hats do we have access um where are the dad hats they're in the, the trunk of my car how many more dad hats do we have probably about 10 i love that we're just popping the trunk yeah <laughs> it's so, old, so old school pop the trunk. that's where we get our mixtapes joe Pop yeah. the trunk. You want that Brian cassette <laughs> with all of our OG jams? I got that too. What you need? What you need, girl. Um, okay. But my point is, there's a nature's relief over there. This Not dress. only is there a nature's relief over there, we're going to be doing a show from the nature's relief. Holly Ridge, Glenwood Ave, old school, sir. Old school. Love it. Nature's relief. That is 9-12. That's a Thursday, 9-12. We will be there with our friends, Jennifer, at nature's relief go check them out of course i got the one on the home base timber drive garner you got them over on western mm -hmm. where we did our previous show so i'm excited to hit this nature's relief that o'malley's that's like that's like straight out of 1978 that's man a, that's a spot. i love that place that's a spot for you and me yeah that and, is a spot and, and for you, you got and the me. peddler over there you got the italian joint over there what was it uh casalinga i think is what it's no <laughs> what's it called <laughs> no 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 not that joe <laughs> There was a place. There was a place. I'm not kidding you. It was called Casa Linga. I'm not making that up. It was off a of capital, actually. Casa Carbone. For her That's the name. <laughs> hey, where'd you go last night? Casa Linga. Wait, you did what now? Yeah, man. Slurped up, the, slurped up that spaghetti like nobody's business. Wait, what? In front of the doorbell. Twirled that thing. What? <laughs> Excuse me? That's terrible. Ooh. Ooh. the best eggplant parmesan you ever had <laughs> but yeah no it's casa carbone that's the name of the place uh oh is our guy here? i think our guy is here but anyway that's nature's relief oh one other note uh big thanks to butcher's market as we go welcome our guest here uh go check out the butcher's market tailgating needs all there the butcher's markets.com you will win the tailgate with our friends at the butcher's market Joining us in studio on the Heaster Automotive Group hotline is writer, director, Ron Shelton. And Bull Durham, which I think most, like 99% of the people who listen and watch this podcast know Bull Durham. But there's a musical that's coming to Duke University September 10th through the 22nd. It's the first time the musical will be in Durham. And Ron Shelton is hanging out with us in studio to talk about that. Ron, thanks for coming by. I'm just happy to be here. and hope I can help the ball club, guys. <laughs> so... Bull Durham, the musical. How long has this been in the works to, to convert that into what, what's going to happen now? We, um, in the early 2000 teens, it takes several years to develop a musical because you can't rehearse it, but every six months, because you got to put the cast of 30 together and the mm -hmm. music, and it's expensive. So we got it fully financed about five years ago. We were waiting, negotiating for Broadway Theater, all out of New York, big time. And the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And as you recall, Broadway shut down for almost three years. And so any shows that were in line had to 
did what we did. We had to return the money to the investors and say, we'll start over after Broadway's up again. So what we're here to do, we've got the same show, ready to go to Broadway. We're doing a two-week showcase here with New York talent and a lot of local talent. Mm -hmm. And then the financiers are coming in from New York to see it. And then God willing on to Broadway. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm in awe over here. I wrote, for, uh, I wrote, I don't belong in the same class as you. Okay. But I wrote for a newspaper for 24 years and there's times like we'll, we'll go over some song lyrics and I'll say to him, man, I would have given anything to have written that one line. Right. Like I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. Right. Like if I, if I could have yeah. come up with that, right. Now I got to ask you, man. And these, these are my worst. These are my least favorite questions, but I have to ask. You. <laughs> I have to ask you this. Do you have a favorite line that you've written? Because I got like three of them that I could I could pop here for you. Uh, well, I want to hear yours. I, I would think a line that is sort of who I am behind the scenes of doing this is Crash tells Nuke when he's going to the big leagues, we play this game out of fear and arrogance, which is to say we all have fear of everything, working, living, dying, failing. But the answer to that is to be arrogant and charge forward, you know, chase the sharks, as they say. So I think that's that's a line that nobody ever quotes, but it's sort of like, yeah, that's kind of who I am. We we think of when we hear soliloquies, we think of Shakespeare, but obviously, you know, Kevin Costner gives us a soliloquy and there's there's any number of lines in there. But did did Lee Harvey Oswald act alone? Well, I I think he did, okay. but <laughs> uh, I, I I took put that in because it was a really unpopular, everybody believed in a conspiracy then and probably now, but there's a handful of books that make a very convincing case that he was his lone gunman. And I wanted that speech, what I believe in, to both attract and piss off everybody. On, so nobody could say, <laughs> well, is he liberal, conservative, nothing independent, does he vote? <laughs> After that speech, all you want to say is, this is a pretty interesting dude. I want to hang with him because <laughs> he doesn't fit any mold. That's all I was doing. Well, that's an, that's an unbelievable one, but not my favorite line. My favorite line comes from white man can't jump. Sometimes you win. Sometimes when you win, you really lose. And sometimes when you lose, you really win. So we, we do a bit with uh, the Hurricanes coach, Rod Brindamore. We're yeah. like, if just from these words, let's try mm -hmm. to figure out, did they win or did they lose? And we love to play that clip of, you know, sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we won the game, but I didn't like the way we played. Right. You know, that, that, that sort of thing. So... Julia has been going down the rabbit hole of clips and things like that. And and like we mentioned earlier, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, we're of the age bull Durham and white man can jump in particular were movies that weren't necessarily aimed at us as kids, but they were clearly formative for us, not only as sports fans, but also just like adults, you know, how adults operated. So I, I will always appreciate that about those two movies in particular. Well, I, as I said earlier to you guys, I, I'd like to make our rate of movies that people who are underage sneak into. You see, that's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> definitely happens. Definitely happened. Obviously, you know, Bull Durham for you, based on your own experiences, did you know, was that like your true passion project? Like, did you know, okay, like, was that one, the one that you wrote and you did and you're like, okay, this is the one that's going to put me on the map or was it? more like i said like that passion project you're like okay fine i'm pushing the, the chips all in i'm gonna make this thing work with this well i wanted i direct i'd written a couple of things and they didn't do great business but they kind of got good reviews and then uh but along the process i said i gotta direct i i it's very athletic it's like coaching a team it's, it's organization it's prep and then you got to go with what's happening in front of you uh i think it's very, quite an athletic endeavor and I said, the only way I'm going to do it is if I write about a subject that nobody can say anybody knows more about than me. That's life on the bus rides in the minors. Mm -hmm. Even so, even with Kevin, it barely, barely, barely got made. So and it was an $8 million movie, by the way. So um, try to do that today. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> uh, trust that for inflation, right? Yeah. Um, so so I, I didn't know. I was just happy to get it off the ground. I wrote a book about it a couple of years ago called The Church of Baseball. Studio hated it. I fought for my life. They tried to fire Tim. They tried to fire me. The, the crew and the cast rallied around me. And then everybody was bad-mouthing it. And then it came out. The reviews were through the roof, and it was a big hit. So everybody loved me. So uh, it, you just have to learn to trust yourself mm -hmm. and not the people talking around you. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I was going to say, as people who are now doing this independently, yes, you you do have to just kind of believe in what you're doing, and hopefully the audience will find it, which clearly has been the case with the work you've done. Although I've always been curious, why the Bulls? Yeah, how did you land on that? Because you played for Rochester, right? I played all over the country and ended in AAA in Rochester in the International League. I didn't, um, uh, I never played in the Carolina League. (laughs) Okay. Um, The producer of the team was from Durham. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. of the movie movie okay and he owned a little piece of the Durham Bulls and before I'd even written the script I said let me go back and hang out yeah in the Carolinas I, I thought a southern setting would be appropriate for the movie there's sort of a timelessness mm-hmm. you know and I drove all over Nashville and the Sally League and I went all over the league and teams I didn't even know what league they were and I saw that nothing had changed in the minors but Durham like Raleigh was, was hardly the booming place it is. Now Durham was boarded up downtown. Every store was boarded up. Yeah. I love the ballpark in the middle of neighborhoods and abandoned tobacco factories because mm-hmm. tobacco was dying. Mm-hmm. People walking from their homes. I thought this is quintessential small town. Uh, never dreamed that you know, research triangle, the whole thing would explode. Now it's, this is a happening area. I tell people in California, you can get a 10 times bigger house for about 5% of the cost. Get back there. <laughs> don't, no, no, no. Ron, don't tell people that. Home values, I mean, I appreciate them, but whoo, they're off the charts right now. I was just listening, driving over here. Uh, the public radio station yeah. had a, a real estate guy, and they were talking about, you know, well, the average income is 70000 and you can, you know, it costs three hundred and seventy to buy a house. I three hundred seventy thousand. I can't buy a this million dollar house trailer near me. You know, <laughs> a trailer. Having having some friends that spend time in the Bay. That's area. where hometown yeah. reality comes in. Yeah, yeah that's true. Real effect. That's there, true. Right? Got to yeah. pay some of our bills here. Yeah, some 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 friends of ours uh, moved out to the Bay Area, and uh, it was almost like a like hitting the lottery because you got to buy a house there, and then you sell that house there for a lot of value. You just come back here and pay cash. But yeah. I don't want people to know that. Yeah. I like to, you know. So I anyway, I ended up in Durham. Tom Mount didn't make me. I just said, that's the perfect spot. This is it. Yeah. And I shot in Raleigh, as you know. I shot mm-hmm. at Mitch's Tavern. Yep. We're going to go over there because it's still open late it one of these is. nights. Yeah. And I shot the, the batting cage scene in Raleigh. So I shot all over the place. Okay. I was going to say, who owes you more money? Sizzler, Mitch's, <laughs> or the Durham Bulls? Uh, I think... <laughs> and where did Sizzler come from, man? Like, <laughs> Sizzler... You pulled that out of your back pocket. Come on. Um... The actor, uh, Kadeem Hardison, yeah. um, he was a TV star, but I didn't know it. And I, we offered him one line in the movie. And his agent called and said, Kadeem is insulting. He got one, one line. He's a TV mm-hmm. star. I said, I've never heard of him. I said, I never heard of him. I don't watch TV. I it's said, a different world. Ron. Different but, world. I know. <laughs> Quintessential <laughs> show. I said, oh, that's right. And, <laughs> and I said, it, you know, this isn't the part of Othello, okay? It's not like the Moorish king of... It's more I said, I said, but put him on the phone. And he got on the phone. I said, Kadeem, come in. You got one line. If you're smart, it's going to be a free for all. You can steal the movie. You can turn one into 20. So he comes in. He says, I'm in. I don't know what it is, but I'm in. He comes in, really smart dude. And he shows up in a Jordan jersey. We didn't need rights. We didn't get rights to anything. We just did it. <laughs> you just did it, right. Okay? And he figures out. I'm going to be right off of Wesley Snipes' shoulder every time Wesley does anything. <laughs> so anytime there's a shot of Wesley, He's there. I'm the guy. <laughs> He's there. And he came up with Sizzler in um, in rehearsal. Okay. I put it in the script. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, improv works. Improv works. While, while I'm here, man. Um, Quince. Foods that start with Q. Do you know that it's now a category on Jeopardy? Is it legitimately? Yeah. What? They made and they had to come category. up with their own. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They made up with a guy. They came up with a category. I think the, I feel like the Quince producers owe you something too. Are there any Quince, Quince producers? Quince, I don't know. Do they, do, they, do they still exist? Anyway. Uh, I don't know. Like, where does that come from? Like, you're sitting and you're writing something like, like, where well, does that even come from? Well, Hemingway said, write drunk, edit sober. And mm-hmm. that's my, my, uh, we just, I, 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 we just I'm had this conversation. We just had this conversation. We literally not, just had this yes. conversation. I don't, people think I do. I don't smoke <laughs> weed. I've had, I've never, I came out of the 60s. Smoke free. Okay, weed, yeah. But drinking. Same thing. No, you, you have to, when you're writing, you know, I think not the writers who aren't great, they just write 
the first thing in their head. And mm-hmm. you got to say, wait a minute. That's what everybody in writing school would do. Go to the next, go to the next. Go to, look at it from an angle that you can look at it that nobody else is going to look at it. So I sat around. I spent a lot of time on the Jeopardy questions. <laughs> the rest of the script wrote fast. <laughs> And then, and then we took it in, and Jeopardy said, this category doesn't work. This category doesn't work. I said, what are the rules of a category? Yeah. It's got to be a national question. It can't be like, I had some LA-centric questions. Yeah. Uh, California, no. Because national audience. And um, so I went back and came up with food to start with letter Q, and they said, we love that. I, w- I said, I've only got five of them. <laughs> I was interested in that, specifically to White Man Can't Jump and, and Bull Durham. They're classified as sports movies, but I have always argued that they're actually, like in the case of Bull Durham, it's more of a romantic comedy that has a baseball rapper. I think in the same case Mm -hmm. with White Man Can Jump, there's a societal story that you're telling, and there's also a couple dynamics wrapped around basketball. But your most, in my opinion, your your most hardcore sports movie that you wrote was Blue Chips. And I felt like that one, I ate that up because I thought it was an interesting look of how college basketball was at that time with people like Shaq and Anthony and things Way like that. Way ahead of your time, too, well, and with NIL. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the other thing that I was curious about. When you when you write a, a very hardcore sports movie like that and you see you were ahead of the game on some things, you're exposing some things, and you see where college sports is today, have you considered revisiting yeah. something like that? Oh, yeah. No okay. question. I, in fact... In retrospect, I should have directed it. I, they wanted me to direct it. I just done White Me Can't Jump, and I, mm-hmm. I don't want to do back to back basketball movies. Okay. And I had something else I was working on. But I, I'm developing something for TV uh, that's a very hardcore look at what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. Um, it isn't set up yet, but we're in the middle of it. Fact, okay. I've got to zoom at noon tomorrow to LA. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's basically, it, it's set in the world of, Pro football and pro basketball, and all about the owners and the and the and the and the, and the player development guys, and the, it's the it takes the position that the game off the field is way more compelling than the game on the field, mm-hmm. and it's the real contact sport. Yeah, it's the real blood sport. Mm-hmm. I'm in total agreement with you on that. Um, you you sold me. I'm in, and it's and it's out there. I mean, there's people die and people. Mm-hmm. get laid and people draw. I mean, but it's the owners and it's that side. Yeah. We kind of know who the players are. Yeah. There've been attempts at this, but they've usually uh, been kind of watered down. Uh, yeah. Whether it's, um, you had playmakers on ESPN that got shut down because the NFL didn't like it. Well, and also, it, it, see, the the truth is, a drama should be based on the truth. Yeah. And the truth is wilder. Yeah. You know, Carol Rosenblum, he died. Was he mob connected? I don't know, but he drowned in one inch of water in a in Orange County, L.A. Uh, Jeannie Buss was wasn't she a playmate? Now she owned what? Jerry Buss was hanging out in a horror house, uh, and was brilliant. Mm-hmm. And then you go to all the contemporary owners, and is there any better character ever than Al Davis, who was way ahead of his time until he was way behind? I mean, yeah, these guys are really interesting. Jerry Jones is a star. Jerry, with Dallas. Jo- Jerry He's Jones. A star. Yeah, Jerry Jones will love our show because he knows there's no such thing as bad publicity. This is right. true. This is true. <laughs> so why why TV over a movie? Is that just where things are right now? Yeah, yes, the TV is more active than movies okay. because nobody's going to theaters and, unless it's a superhero movie. Yeah, and so I'm working in both TV and gotcha with blue chips. What, who was more difficult to work with, Nick? Well, I didn't or direct, Bobby Knight. You didn't I, direct I, I, I didn't. Oh, direct, you said it right that I didn't direct it. <laughs> I wish I did because I think the script got actually watered down from what okay. I'd written. Okay. Um, I, I went, I got into a fight with the director, Billy Friedkin, the late, great, crazy Billy Friedkin. I said, Billy, Shaq is writing me, rewriting the scene. What the hell does Shaq know about? It? And Shaq, I like. <laughs> Shaq, by the way, on that set met Penny Hardaway and, and they were arranging for the trade right, right then there, on the movie. Right, to get to the match. I mean, they were passing the phone back to their agent somewhere. <laughs> And then a little while later, Hardaway <laughs> traded to Orlando. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, one more, if you got a couple more minutes for us. Um, literally just talked to one of my friends yesterday who played golf, and he said, yeah, I tin cupped it on 60. Like, come on, man. Like, yeah, you did that too. Come on. Like, that, that's true. where did all that come from? <laughs> every every time I hear the guys on TV say he's going tin cup, I smile. <laughs> you know Where'd where that, that come from, man? I'll tell you where it came from. 
Um, Couldn't have been the bottle I, of Colonel. I, I, I wrote <laughs> no. I wrote that with one guy. I, if occasionally, if I don't write solo, I have one guy I'll write with, and his name is John Norville. He's a really good writer. He lives in Oregon. He played golf at Stanford. That's how good a golfer he was. Okay. Okay. And he's a really good writer. And he lives up there overlooking the Deschutes River and he fly fishes and he plays golf. Mm -hmm. And he writes. And we're watching the Masters way back. And I'm in Southern California. When Chip Beck laid up on 13 on Sunday. Oh, no. Chip Beck, Raleigh guy. <laughs> yeah. And he laid up. And he ends up making a bogey. And Bernard Langer went for it and made – he lost. Yeah. How can you lay up? And it turned out it was probably a smart play, but it really looks bad in TV and you can't lay up. Yeah. Right? So I'm on the phone with him. I say, what if we make about a guy who can't lay up, but that's, that's his strength and his weakness mm -hmm. because sometimes you got to lay up. <laughs> and, um, and so we started with the ending of what a guy who makes a 13 on the last hole. And we went back and then worked our way up to earn that. When you get, and obviously Kevin, you know, you're kind of linked to Kevin, yeah. obviously because of those two movies, but like Don Johnson was right. kind of amazing in that movie too. We could Cheech we, was really good in that movie you know too. What? Like you, you, I, you I had inter, some really good character I, Cheech, was the, Cheech hadn't been seen in like three years. Right. And he came in, the first guy I interviewed for Romeo the Caddy. Mm -hmm. And he was great. And then I did like 80 actresses, Latino actors, actors. And I could bring Cheech back. And he walked in and I said, give it to, this is the guy. <laughs> <clears throat> he's a great guy, really bright. Mm -hmm. He plays that goofball, really smart, thoughtful guy. He's got a museum, an art museum of Latino art. Down mm -hmm. there. He's a, and then Don, we couldn't figure out who plays that character because David Sims, who's based on some real names in the PJ yeah. tour that I won't name. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's okay. The statute of limitations are up now. Well, <laughs> I know, but I have another golf movie and I need to go. Oh. <laughs> Man, still go got to work. Come on now. <laughs> PGA, I need, you know. <laughs> no, I, we said the problem with getting a great actor who's an unknown to play the star, David Sims, when the star is playing the unknown, that skews it for an audience. So I need another recognizable face. Mm -hmm. To play off of Kevin. To play yeah. Kevin. Yeah. And, and, and an agent called me who was a buddy and said, Don Johnson. I said, great. Fly him over. We were, in, we were like a week from shooting. We we're in Arizona. I said, fly him in. So he flies him in. He comes in. He's charming. He's smarmy. But he's great. Don's a great guy. He's just, he's the guy. And then he goes out in the hallway. And he's come with his assistant. And I said, that was pretty great. And we hear this noise. We go out there and he's screaming at his assistant, just like the character. <laughs> I said, hire this guy. Get him. It's the real deal. <laughs> I, there isn't. Uh, so uh, I'm turning 50 this year and I've had two back surgeries and uh, my golf game. I'm obsessed with golf. I live on a golf course. And uh, there isn't a, a day or a round that goes by that I don't think about the driving range bet. There's not, <laughs> I'm telling you, I think about that all the time. Like, it's okay. You know, you don't have to swing super hard and hit it that far. You just be smart about what you're doing. And I think about that all the and time. And he gets so. the shanks on the range at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so good, man. So good. And and I'm glad you're here in town to to get this thing off the ground. I know. Uh, I, like I said, a passion project, obviously now with the pandemic kind of interrupting it. And I'm sure you love being back in the triangle and, I love and, it and spending time no, I, here. I'm and, serious. I, I think it's a great area. Uh, I like, I'm getting to know Raleigh better than before. Which I'm amazed how many cool things are here and, and how happening it is. And Durham, I'd known was on the recovery for 30 years, mm -hmm. which I take complete credit for. Thank you. You should, you should do this. And, uh, Absolutely. <laughs> yes. I've been to two bull games. Yeah. It's a little different than the movie. Yeah, but they, you know, the the owner, the, the GMs there say, you built this place. I said, well, then I'm not buying the drink. <laughs> I was going to say, I hope, my, not. I hope Mike Burling, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about Mike Burling, the VP of baseball operations yeah. over at the Durham Bulls, yeah. who's an incredible guy. Yes. I, I love Mike. Mike's been uh, an awesome dude to work with in the past and whatnot. Uh, he, he is a, he understands the caretaking that comes with that, uh, with the logo and everything else that, you know, the movie helped make this iconic image. So I saw more women with their kids all wearing lollygagger shirts. Oh, yeah, man. And oh. My, by the way, my son bought, he was on his way back to college where he's a catcher. Yeah. And he came through for two days. He, was, he just left last night in Ohio. He's going to school. And he um, 
he was advising our actors about the catching part of it. But we went to the bowl game and they're selling shower shoe jerseys because the fungus <laughs> on the shower shoe speech <laughs> and a fungus on the shower shoe hat. Yeah. I bought the hat. He bought the jersey and he wears it. He's wearing it back to college. They, you know, they have uh, like at the Washington Nationals Park, they have the presidential racers, right? Right. They have the same thing at the Bulls. I know it. I love it. With, uh, with Annie running around. And I nuke, mean, crash and nuke. It basically, as I've tried to explain to the kids, I'm like, don't ask too deep a questions <laughs> as to these two men chasing this one woman. <laughs> just don't ask. Like, I'll show you guys the movies eventually, but uh, right now, just don't ask enough questions about this guy thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's one of the, and again, you mentioned the lollygagger oh. shirts and things like that. I mean, heck they're, they're selling Lelouch and Crash Davis, I know. uh, old school looking jerseys and things like that, which are fantastic. Add candlestick makers to yes. the list of people who owe you. Yes. Well, you never have to worry about what to get anybody. Just, you're you right. I got a whole closet. We'll give them candlesticks. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, we appreciate the time. Thanks for hanging out and coming to the studio with us. Yeah. Great conversation. Bull um, Durham, a new musical. It's at Duke University, September 10th through 22nd. I'm assuming they can get tickets the old-fashioned way. Is, a, is there a website for these things? Or Yeah, Theater Raleigh, they're, they're on sale. Um, yeah, just look up Theater Raleigh because okay. um, they're, they're involved. Um, what did, no, wait a second. What are the songs in, in, in Bull Durham, the musical? Did you have oh, to write great. new songs? No, or? I didn't, but a lot, the brilliant composer and she, I said, any lyric you want, just use. Yeah. But she's brilliant on her end. It's really Southern roadhouse kind of music. It's okay. not, it's not, you know, that wicked, wicked. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's, okay. it's, it's not rent is what you're telling me. <laughs> yes. Okay. It's not rent. It's a, it's a different thing. Yeah. Uh, all right, but now I'm curious. Like, is there a is there a musical number around the monologue? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, right. it has, has to be one of those. Okay. Fair enough. And and uh, yeah, uh, got to get a bathtub on the stage. Every every woman deserves to wear white is a song. All right. Woman empowerment song. There's um uh ha when Jimmy and Millie start meeting. Jimmy's never been with a woman. She's never met a player she wasn't with. They start singing to each other, have I got a heaven for you? <laughs> <laughs> Rob, we appreciate it. Thanks Good luck. Guys. Big thanks to Happy and Hail. Check them out. Happy and Hail. Download the app. You can get uh, some amazing bowls. The burger bowl is fantastic. The smoothies are great. Joe might be splashing a little Colonel Taylor <laughs> into his Almond Brothers oh. ahead of the podcast festival on Saturday. I went to Happy Hill yesterday. Yeah. they. I got the banana strawberry almond milk. It's called the superhero. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah. Would it be better with the Colonel? I was contemplating that while I was drinking, and I'm not going to lie to you. Only one way to find out. You, 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 I feel like you have me on restrictions for Saturday. Yes, I do, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody has to be the adult, Joe. Somebody has to be the adult. It's fair. But you know how Plus, people feel a, about I, Drunk Julio. Yeah, but like, so do you, I mean, I guess the question is, how spicy do you want to be with Debbie? Oh, okay. You're saying class the joint up a little bit. You know how you get on my ass about polish? Polish. Wow, Sometimes man, these new transitions, though, that's polish. Well, man. I need a little polish from Joe Giglio in a live setting. Okay. Not drunk Joe. It's fair. Okay. Let's take a break. Let's take a drinking break. <laughs> Brought to you by Drunk Gas, Joe. Let's row back it up. Check it out. <laughs> Rowback.com. <laughs> what? <laughs> It's just so good. Check out Roback.com. Use that promo code OG20. <laughs> Again, hoodies are the theme of the day today. Julio's got his Roback hoodie on right now. That material is fantastic. It's this side. Yeah, check that out, man. It's good stuff. You can get yours right now at Roback. R-H-O back. OG20 is that promo code to save 20% off your order. Maybe I should, you know, speaking of you drinking on the job, I feel like I should go to Wicker and Hamer and get a contract for Saturday. That's probably Put that a in good, writing. good call for you. See if Josh and the crew can make sure I can get a contract out of that. Yeah, I mean, if, they can. if you need something as simple as that, just go to wh.lawyer, attorneys and counselors at law. And of course, our friends over at Hometown Realty, uh, as I mentioned, that hockey life is about to start up. And I'm going to see that Hometown Realty sign as I go to Garner twice a week. The, the G, baby. Be all up in the G. Let's go. 
Maybe you want to live in the G. Contact my hometown realtor, myhtr.com, and tap in to that new construction. It's all fantastic stuff. All thanks to our friends at Hometown Realty. I'm surprised you were able to get up and walk around after sitting down and chatting with Ron Shelton, Joe. It's, it's has, over. I peaked. I got that, nothing else, has, man. Has that boner subsided? I, I have nothing else in this world because, <laughs> as I told him when he walked in, going to see White Man Can't Jump in the theater, like, I, I was out there like Billy Ho. Like, I was out there trying to, you know, put the tie-dye on. Yeah. So, it's so goddamn hard to make something look this... Uh, this pretty look ugly and it's like that was me man like i went out and i i shot hoops like the rest of the summer after seeing that movie so after that conversation with shelton uh governor's off if, if you want to get shit faced at the podcast festival get oh it's okay now. it's okay now if ron shelton's like yeah no nah, man it's like hemingway but, said <laughs> write drunk and edit, edit sober. sober but but <laughs> I wasn't, that wasn't the permission I was taking. I was oh, okay, more of like, okay. you and I were having a disagreement over the number of people who perform. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, yeah, or yeah. enhanced by alcohol and, and to, well, to, <laughs> or to, drugs. To, to, can we, I actually, to, to get into Hey Joe, I did get some response to that conversation from, okay. some, from some people. And I think the, I think one of my friends put it probably the best. He's like, both you and Joe are right in that. There are certain genres, certain arcs, like you said, on the come up yeah. or a particular genre, right? Yeah. Where, yeah, they're they're inebriated. That's the performance enhancer. Um, but, but, but as concerts have gotten more involved, as they've to become your point more, about Taylor Swift, yeah. they've become more physical endeavors. You're out there for three hours. Like something tells me Bruce Springsteen is probably a well oiled machine at this point in time in his life. He's having the Almond Brothers smoothie, not he has anything to. in it. <laughs> Yeah. I, re I didn't complete my story when I referenced Metallica, but Jim Brewer is a comedian that was doing like a work uh, ahead of the show. They didn't have an opener. It was like Jim Brewer just doing jokes along with a DJ that was playing classic rock music. And he made at the this... one in Detroit that you went to? No, that was oh. a different show. That was a different show. This was the one at PNC Arena. And Brewer's like, all right, man, we're going to do a backstage tour. Like it's a classic, you know, goat boy mode. And they essentially was making fun of the fact that this is a yoga room now. They're the kale over, smoothie. Or... They're doing, yeah, all these kale smoothies. He goes, buddy, let me tell you, if this was 1988, <laughs> I couldn't show you what was behind <laughs> this door. And I was like, okay, yeah, I get it. But in order for Lars to drum the way he drums now, to keep the speed that he did back when he was young, he's he's got to leave a clean, he's got to live a clean life, man. So essentially, you you, you find what works for you. You find what works yeah. for you, and that's the point of this conversation, Joe. You find what works for you on Saturday. You be you. You can be cat. In, Just, the, in the great words of the philosopher Mark Godfrey. Well, it's interesting you, you bring you. that up. Uh, our friend J.C. Zembel over at Wolfpack Central did point out to me a C.J. Leslie moment when we were talking about the sorority stuff. Oh. And he texts me, <laughs> off-season protocols went by too fast. <laughs> Nothing came off as old when you were explaining to Jillio <laughs> about sorority reels. As C.J. Leslie said, you and me, we ain't we the same. Ain't the same. Enoch over at Nice Price sent me this uh, this tweet. He's like, speaking of sororities, I don't think Jillio understands how serious this shit gets. Okay. Right down to a transfer portal, Joe. No. Oh, yes. Uh, Larry, this is an original tweet from Larry yesterday. Uh, yeah, no, two days ago on the 19th. He tweets, it's actually hilarious how girls will come to an SEC school to rush, not get a house they wanted, and then leave the university. To which Gabby chimes in, then you have the ones who sneak into SEC sororities by rushing at small Southern liberal arts universities, promptly transfer to the SEC school of their choice to the affiliate with the chapter there. And she continues, and she's like, it's not just, you know, something that you can just do. Transfers just don't randomly show up in Walt's in. There's a process, paperwork, <laughs> that starts with the transfer student speaking to an exec at the chapter that initiated them and informing them of their intent to transfer. They continue. Each chapter has different policies. Some require a full chapter vote. Others leave it up to the exec. 
in the largest chapters with 300 to 400 members and upwards of 100 members in pledge classes, it's not uncommon for housekeeping announcements at chapter to include an intro to a transfer member without the matter being widely socialized prior. It's not every week, but one to two or three a year might be reasonably expected. So to answer your question about these reels and what exactly you're witnessing, I told you, I tried to tell you, this is serious business and it's all a part about, it's all about being part of that group, yeah. man. It's about that group. And then come to find out your Instagram reels continue to be a situation oh, where your I, algorithm I walked into this one. is built brick <laughs> by freaking brick, Joe. This is bad for me. <laughs> now you're getting Liberty back to school videos, dude. What I got your your timeline needs a cleanse. I don't know how. So back to school at Liberty and it's he's time. Give me a look. I don't know what song this is because it ain't DC talk. It's not John Michael McDonald or whatever that guy's name was. Petra. Kirk Franklin. Kirk Frank, <laughs> that, that's that was my era, man. DC LA 94, baby. That was my era of praise music. I don't know what that is, but dude, you need, time light, you need a timeline cleanse badly. I, I even sent you that one. I said, I, I earned this. <laughs> you did. You did. Just like I've earned people sending me AI Americana roots bluegrass. Mm. Got this from a listener asking AI to create Star Wars an Appalachian story. Oh, no. Do I even want to? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. I mean... <laughs> That's good. I mean, Leia... That's good. If you're watching on YouTube, I mean, Leia in a pearl button snap shirt with the jeans... I don't Han, care if it's Han AI. Good too, Han yeah. looking good with a cowboy hat. Yeah, it's oh no! Oh, Are they sorry, cooking sorry. the Ewok? I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Are they? I think they're. I think Chewbacca's cooking the Ewok. No. Oh, he's talking, oh, he's talking, oh. Yeah, that's what Darth, and Darth Vader. That's what Darth Vader would do. Yeah. So somebody makes a comment, Luke. I'm your pappy. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> You've earned that as well. Yeah, brick by brick, dude. Brick by brick. All right, let's go to the YouTube comments. Uh, we've got uh, Jeremy here. Glad Jillio agrees with me about the Dolphins and the playoff success. They have to hold serve. I work with a big Dolphins fan, and I always tell them the Finns have to get home field yes. throughout the playoffs to get to the Super Bowl. They are not built for success in cold weather climates in January. Yeah, I no, totally agree with you on that. From uh, Ken, what is the OG discount for you line? <laughs> I need some stuff from my garage. Yes. I'll bring it to you, buddy. I got you. <laughs> uh, shout out to Left Shot Dev and some others who did get the Ben Folds reference, citing artistic differences. I left the broadcast booth in May. <laughs> Yet yeah, there were certainly some artistic differences uh, when we left the broadcast booth. Uh, let's see from uh, from Bramp. You guys were a little too late for the bunch of folks at WKNC, the college radio station at NC State, that ran around with Phi Upsilon Kappa. Oh, I get it. Uh, shirts just to poke fun at the other fraternity dudes, including getting on at least a few ESPN basketball games sitting in the front row of the stands. Uh, from Philip, hey oh. Joe, thoughts on Acolyte being canceled after one's... I feel like this is a mailbag question. Mm. I feel like I'm going to save this one for the mailbag. Okay. OG Mailbag comes out on Friday. Go to ogtrianglemedia.com to sign up today. Uh, let's go to Twitter where Chris, hey, is there a schedule for Saturday night at the OG Podcast Festival. We go on at six. That's all you need to know. Okay. That's all you need to know. When did the doors open? I think the doors open at 4.30. Really? Or five? Because we have we have merch to have access to. Sure. But I think that I think that schedule you're is going to get finalized. That you're saying I'm going to be there at five, not drink, and go on at six. Joe, you can do whatever you want, dude. Buddy. You can do whatever you Come want. On. From Celeste, I'll be getting the Sal from Bayonne experience <laughs> Friday at Citizens Bank Park. Oh, Celeste. Please up prayers, us. man. Peace Please and, update peace us. Peace and peace, Sandy. <laughs> and lastly, from Mister Marshall, I'm terrified to bring this back after last year. But where would you put the Panthers? Where should Panthers fans be on the chart this year? The mood meter: high energy, low energy, unpleasant, pleasant. 
Uh, Mom would be sad. It's so over. It is what it is. We are so effing back. F it, we ball. Right now, I think we're at it is what it is with the Panthers. Yeah, I would say that. It's, it is what it is with uh, the little injuries that continue to pile up and become a problem. At least last checked, I was checking out Mike K's uh, treatment of the Panthers earlier today. And I guess they had a fully healthy offensive line for the first time in a while. At practice. That's good. That's good. Progress. That's good. Maybe that will lead to them playing Bryce Young in the last preseason. Oh, I game? hope not. I already locked in. But the you're Bills locked in and the Danuch. <laughs> All right. Uh, we so can't handle that. <laughs> so be it. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for today's show. We will see. A little premature on the uh, pausing there. Oh, that's good. <laughs> let's let's actually say goodbye. Oh, we'll see. You. Well, let's say thank you too. Yes, because we don't we don't get. Ron Shelton without Andrea. No. We don't get Mike Houston with our guy Malcolm. Mm-hmm. So appreciate them for taking care of us. What an episode, man. What number is this? Uh, 245. Uh, I was really hoping it would be not a round number mm-hmm. because you know how I feel about round numbers. We, mm-hmm. we put too, way too much importance on them. But I agree. Mark that shit down. OG 245. That's a winner, man. When, when I go back next year in December and I tell you, let's do some year in review shit. OG 245. It, it's a, like with a bullet, man. Could you say confidently that there was a lot to get into today? There was a shit ton to get into today. I like that. I'm glad that there was actually a lot to get into today. We've got a lot to get to. Close it on that. We'll see you Thursday for an OG live.